we'd like to thank you all for coming to Afternoon Conversations, and uh, I hope you guys are getting along with your neighbors. Uh, we do have a uh, <laughs> packed house um, here, but um, uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Ms. Regina Boone from the uh, Richmond Free Press, and she's going to be talking today about her, uh, her grandfather, I believe it is, uh, uh, Suruju uh, Miyazaki, who is a, uh, a Japanese business owner. Um, uh, in Suffolk during the Second World War, and she's going to tell his story. And so, I'd like that. <laughs> so, hi, good afternoon, and um, thank you for coming out. I would, I'm surprised to see so many of you here on a Wednesday at 2 o'clock. <laughs> so, um, I'm grateful, and I'm grateful for your interest and my story. So, I'm going to keep this pretty casual and just kind of walk you through the journey that I've been going through as I've been on this quest for my grandfather, Suruju. And so yeah, the pronunciation of his first name is Suruju. His family name uh, was and remains uh, Miyazaki. And um, yeah, so I kind of wanted to start with, oh wait, I have to get used to this uh, computer. So you guys bear with me. Click that one. Oh, just click on the mouth. Yeah. Okay. So this is a little bit small, but I just wanted to kind of connect myself to Suffolk. Um, so my father, Raymond H. Boone, he was from Suffolk, and his mother, Letha Boone, uh, was from Suffolk. And so I have this little breakdown, just so you, I do have, I have deep roots here. Um, although I, w I would like to say that um, I'm just getting to know my Suffolk roots and a lot about Suffolk during this journey and um, it's really interesting to learn about both sides of my family on my father's side and also before I go on I just wanted to introduce my mom that she is here with me um, Jean Boone and she drove down with, from Richmond with me so just wanted to um, let you know that there is family here and other family are here too but I don't want to miss some ones but my mom is here um, so anyway my, my grandmother, she's from Suffolk, Letha Boone, and then you can see uh, my, my great-grandfather, William Jesse Boone, and Chessie Falk. So my family, the, the names that I've, I grew up hearing from my father, Falk, Boone, Miltier, Skeeter, so those are just some of the names that I think are pretty popular around here that many of you may have heard. Um, and those are the names I grew up, grew up hearing and knowing a little bit about. And, oops. Oh, that one. Okay. So here's a picture, an older picture of my grandmother, Letha May Boone. So she is a Suffolk uh, native. And then I'm going to introduce you to my grandfather. So this is my grandfather, Suruju Miyazaki. And so my grandmother, Letha, and my grandfather, Suruju, they met. I don't have, this is kind of the journey that I'm on that I'm trying to find out things about how did they meet mm -hmm. at this time. And I should kind of go back to explain to you a little bit of how I got to this point in my life that I'm even thinking about these grandparents and thinking about how they fell in love, thinking about how did my dad come to this world, and really, how did I get to this point, standing here in Suffolk? And so it kind of goes back to my dad, uh, Raymond Boone, who was a journalist, and he started a newspaper, well, he had a, he had a long uh, journalist career, career in journalism, but about five years ago, he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in Richmond, and at that time, he and my mom uh, had started the Richmond Free Press in 1992. And so they've been there with their business and telling other people's stories, you know? And by the way, I'm a journalist too, and that's what I've always done all my life, is tell other people's stories and fight for justice and try to right wrongs through my camera, since I am a photojournalist, and my dad, 
did it with his pen, his typewriter, his voice, and his influence. So as he was dying, sadly, of pancreatic cancer, during the last weeks of his life at, while he was at home, on home hospice, he started talking to my mom, me, other relatives, my brother, from his bed, talking about the father he never knew. And this was a topic that we really didn't talk about in our household. I knew from the age of 13, about 13, I found out that I did have a Japanese grandfather, but I didn't know much else about him. So it was these last days that my, my dad started saying, do you have that picture, this picture? He started saying, um, can you show it to me? This is from his bed, from my parents' bed. And I said, sure, and I was like, whoa, this is a little interesting, you know? He's never talked about this topic, but now he's really wanting to talk about it. And he says, you know, I really regret that I never knew my dad, and I regret that I don't know much more to tell you about him. And he said, Regina, you know, you're a journalist, I'm a journalist, and we fight to right wrongs, and this is one story that I could not do, but you're gonna have to do. So basically, he passed this baton to me and said, I couldn't tell this story, but maybe you can, and maybe you can find out what happened to your grandfather, Suruju Miyazaki, who in Suffolk, by the way, was known as Mike, and some people have told me he was known as Zach, but on his, on his documents that he wrote in his handwriting, he signs his name as Mike. So, um, but of course, there's always, everyone has nicknames for everybody, so. So anyway, he went on to say, Regina, you must find out what happened to your grandfather, my dad, you must tell this story, and you must explain to people that this could happen again. Now this was five years ago when he was telling me this. And so it's kind of interesting that he said this to me five years ago. And look where we are now in our country. And look where how we are repeating things. And that's why it's so important to know your history. Because if we know our history, then we are less likely to repeat the wrongs of our history. Right? So everybody in here has a story. And so this is just my story. And this is because my father passed this baton to me to tell the story of Suruju uh, Miyazaki. So here's my father. He's the product of Letha and uh, Suruju. And along with my father, there was another, another, my uncle, my father's brother, his name was Gerald. Gerald Miyazaki Boone. Now my father's name was Raymond Harold Boone. He's the eldest of the two of that union. And it's interesting, through my research, I've just recently found out that my uncle had this middle name, Miyazaki. That's from pulling uh, records and actually talking to my first cousins who do live here in uh, Suffolk. And they reminded me that the M in Gerald's name, Gerald M. Boone, was Miyazaki. And I was like, whoa, that's interesting. So my dad had never told me that, that piece of information. So this is my father, grew up here um, in Saratoga. Um, this, this name I've always heard of, and so now I'm getting a little bit more familiar with. And he used to talk about Dismal Swamp and all his relatives and family gatherings and the love he had here. And I mean, he talked very positively about growing up in Suffolk, never mentioning this big hole in his life. His father was not present. Where was he? He never mentioned him. He never really said anything. He just, that just wasn't his narrative. So, so this little boy, and it's funny for me to look at him right now because it, he was such a serious child, and this is how my father was in real life. I mean, <laughs> the dad I knew too. I mean, he was playful and funny, but he, I think from the beginning, he came to this earth with purpose, and he left this earth with purpose. And he passed that purpose to me to then share it with the world about this story. So, oh. okay, and so here's his high school uh, graduation picture. 
uh, from East Suffolk High where he graduated in 1955 and I've learned he told me all of these things but to read it again now and to see that he wasn't making up stuff you know dads can sometimes embellish mm -hmm. things but he he was um, he always wanted to be a journalist he always fought for what was right in the community he um, it, people that I've been talking to as I'm beginning to talk to people that knew my dad they say that um, he was always standing up for what was right and of course during this time we're living through Jim Crow uh, time segregation so he's fighting as a black man and fighting for the rights of black people for all people though right for everyone to be treated equally but he this is what he's known from, for from the beginning. That's what I'm get, gathering from conversations. And even in the yearbook, it says that, what did he want to be? Says, aspiring journalist. And he reached that. And it said that he started the yearbook. It says that he started the newspaper at the school. So this man, I feel like, it's interesting. I'm getting to know him better or in a different way now that he's not physically with me. I'm connecting with him in a different way that um, is driving me and seeing how living with purpose is so important and how he was so lucky or as some would say, I don't typically use these words, but some people would say blessed. Um, so he was that. So then, okay, go back. Okay, and so here's a photo of him as he's getting older during uh, college times and during the 60s. This is about the time when he met my mother, I believe. And so this is the man that she met. <laughs> and so, and this, these are some pictures. I'm just taking you through this journey of life, just so you can see. So at this time when my mom meets him, He's this feisty journalist in Washington, D.C. He's a White House reporter for the, um, for the Afro-American newspaper, a, a major newspaper on the East Coast that had 13 newspapers that was a part of the black press. So he's on Capitol Hill. He's fighting for, he's, he's continuing what he's, he's been set to do, right? And he meets my mom. My mom was an intern at the Urban League. <laughs> in uh, Washington and he's calling where my mom worked to get a story and to talk to the director of the Urban League Mr. Granger I believe his name was no Sterling Tucker. oh Sterling Tucker okay sorry <laughs> thanks see that's why moms are here um, so anyway her boss told her to get rid of this reporter get rid of this feisty reporter because you can deal with him, I'm not talking to him, but my dad and those in this audience who knew my dad, maybe some of you, my dad did not give up on anything. He was just like, uh, uh, so he just kept calling. My mom was like, please, okay, you're not gonna talk to the director, you're gonna talk to me, I'm, I'm who you're gonna talk to. So my mom's building this relationship, she's never seen him, but she's kind of like intrigued by this person who's very, he's like a dog with a bone, right? And so she tells me the story that she was living with roommates and they said, hey, why don't you invite that guy who keeps calling and so you can see what he looks like and just see what's up with him. So basically, that's how my mom met my father. I told her if there was a clue to her, maybe just to leave him alone. If he keeps calling, he doesn't listen to authority and you know, <laughs> like, come on. I was like, oh my God, I would have run away from him. But had she run away, I wouldn't be here today. So anyway, the long and short of the story is that he met my mom and they got married and this, these are just some of the, the photos of them. So, and at this time I asked my mom, so did you ask him questions about his, when he showed up and you saw him, is this how you pictured that Ray Boone would look like, that man on the other end of the phone? And she kind of said, no, not really. <laughs> this isn't what he looked like and I was like, well, did you ask him like about his background or weren't you curious and she said yeah you know black folks we all have different colors different hues different hair types we come in all different flavors right so he's just another flavor you know so so but she did say early on 
that he did tell her about his father. It was not an elaborate conversation, but he was up front. And so he did put that information, you know, he trusted my mother and obviously he loved my mom. And so he did tell her that most intimate uh, bit of information about himself. So, um, and then my parents had me. So, <laughs> and so these are three versions of me. Um, <laughs> and then they also have my brother. My brother, who's five years younger, his name is Raymond. He's Raymond Boone Jr. And then our life. So we were, I was born in Richmond. And from Richmond, my dad was uh, an editor, journalist at the Richmond Afro. And from there, we moved to Baltimore. That's where the headquarters was. And that's where I basically grew up in Baltimore. And I attended an all-girls prep school called Roland Park Country School. And this was a school that um, was predominantly white, very waspy, very wealthy, everything that I'm not. So, but I asked my, you know, in, in my household, we are living a different way. And I was always curious, like, why my dad said and my mom agreed that I should go to this kind of school. Of course, because academically it was rigorous and it would prepare me. But it would also prepare me for this world that we live in today, to understand how other people live and how this group of people live and actually it's prepared me today especially to understand racism to understand just how different people think from different socioeconomic backgrounds and I became an expert I guess on uh, the waspy world of uh, white upper class and so this is where I went to school and so that's just a slice of me so this is uh, this is the high school graduation so you can see this is my life and we're weaving through so this is all coming from Suffolk and coming from Columbia South Carolina where my mom is from and from Japan and then on I went to college I went to Spelman College a completely different world than Roland Park Country School Spelman College is a historically black college in Atlanta for black women so that's where I went so I'm just kind of setting the stage that I've been completely raised as a black woman um, in this world and the conversation about my Japanese grandfather really had not woven into my narrative. And just, just that little bit that I knew I had this Japanese grandfather, but that's it. And then from there though, this is where the curiosity, after graduating from Spelman College, the curiosity, the seed was beginning to be planted. And this is when I decided to go to Japan and teach English as a second language as a part of the a program that the Ministry of uh, Education has called the Japanese Exchange Teaching Program. And this is where I taught English for three years as a second language in Japanese public schools. And when I applied for this, uh, for this opportunity, I, did, I looked at my old application and I was wondering where, like today looking at it, looking back, I was like, where was my mind? Who was I then? And I did put one sentence in there that did say, I am part Japanese and I'm interested in learning about the country that my grandfather came from, although I know nothing else. I don't even know the prefecture that he's from. So I think that seed was being planted. And so that's where I was. And while I was there, I did not do uh, much research at all about my grandfather, but I did begin to um, think about him a little bit more because I received a letter from my dad, and I just want to read you a little bit about it. And this is when I'm really introduced to who my fa who my grandfather was. So this was written on January 31st, 1993. Dear Regina, I'm enclosing finally a photograph of your grandfather along with copies of letters that he wrote to your grandmother. The letters are from many that he wrote to her while he was unjustly deterred during one of America's most horrible periods. My delay in getting this material to you may be related to the pain that is experienced when I review it. Also, I was reluctant to transfer this pain to you. I know that this is not at all scientific, but I believe your grandfather's spirit remain strong. It inspired you to want to go to Japan, and now that you are there, you feel compelled to satisfy an undying urge to know more about your heritage. Your grandfather's letters give, con give convincing evidence that he was a good man, a smart man, 
a man who would not accept that which is not fair and just. I am proud of him. I know he did all that he could do for justice as well as for his family, struggling against awful circumstances. So this is the first time in 1993 when I'm in Japan that I get this letter from my dad this period that I now have seen a photograph of him. I'm in my 20s, this is the first time. And when now my dad is actually kind of speaking openly about his feelings and the pain and trauma that he has been walking around with because he's been separated. His family, his mother, his brother, extended family, himself have been separated from his father, just like children today, right? You've heard those cries last week in Mississippi when parents were arrested and children were crying. Some will argue with me and say, oh, that's a different circumstance, but it's not. It's still family separation, no matter what. So, so this is the time. And then from Japan, so that seed is planted. I'm thinking about my grandfather. I did take the time to, I met a friend in Japan who is Japanese American from LA, and she was like, wait, Regina, you're a quarter Japanese. I was like, Oh yeah, I guess so, that's right. She's like, you know, you should look up, you should call the Japanese American Museum in LA and see if they can help you with some research. So this was about 1990, 1996. So I did call the Japanese American Museum. I asked them, I said, I don't know my grandfather's first name. All I know is T. Miyazaki, nickname Mike. He, lives in, he lived in Suffolk. And somehow they were able to find his file. So they sent me a file in 1996. Now that file, I did receive it. I kept it, and I kept it safely. And I still have it with me today. So it traveled with me, but I did not do more with it at that time. I think it just wasn't the time, and I believe timing is everything. So just, so just wanting you to get an idea of my mindset. So I leave Japan, and I decide to do a eight month, I mean a 11 and a half month solo backpacking trip around the world to come back to the United States. So this is just one of my stops um, in Zanzibar. And I stayed there and I stayed with a family. And everywhere I went, I um, stayed with family so that I could understand people and their culture and who they really are. I went to South Africa. I <laughs> rode an ostrich. And then my, my, my travels brought me back to the United States. And they brought me back to Richmond, Virginia where my parents had now started the Richmond Free Press in 1992, the week of Martin Luther King's birthday. And it's a weekly newspaper that comes out every Thursday. And so I joined the team with my mother, my brother, my father, and our staff. And this is where um, I began to be a photojournalist. And so that's where my career started. And then next I moved on with my career I went to grad school and from I went to grad school at Ohio University and in Athens, Ohio. And then from there I was recruited to the Detroit Free Press. And that's where I was a staff photojournalist for um, nearly 15 years, um, up until uh, two years ago um, when I took a voluntary layoff. Ooh, Des. Hi, <laughs> from Detroit. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so this picture was taken when newspapers like the Detroit Free Press and other newspapers were doing well and Des was my colleague at this time and we used this door and if you look at this picture now, half of these people aren't even, they're not, there's probably only three people who, four people who still remain staff. So anyway, I'm weaving my life, I'm telling other people's stories and I'm telling stories in Detroit now. And then the time comes when my dad does get sick and this is I'm in Detroit and I decide I'm going back and forth for this 10 month period when my dad uh, is suddenly uh, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. It was September. It was the first day of school in Detroit I remember because I remember being with this writer and we were doing a first day of school story and my phone, I had two phones, the free, Detroit Free Press phone and my personal phone. My mom was blowing up both of those phones after this assignment. I knew it was an emergency, and it was that my dad was in ICU, and I needed to get home fast. And so I got a flight home late that night, 
NASCAR was happening in Richmond, unfortunately, so I had to fly into DC, rent a car, drive, and then get to the hospital. My dad woke up and said, oh my God, I must be really bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so this is about, these are about the last family pictures with my dad, my brother, and my nephew, Raymond Boone III, and my mom. And so this is when, um, yeah, things are happening, and my dad does <coughs> pass away, and he does, like I started the story off, that he did pass this baton to me. And so I'm going through, like, grieving and ready to leave Detroit and just not sure, but I have this one big last story that I do do. And it's a story about the Flint water crisis. And I took this photo of this little boy named Sincere Smith in Flint, and it made the cover of Time Magazine. But the reason I mention him is because of his name. His name is Sincere Smith. And so when I'm doing this story, and of course, I'm feeling so much empathy for this family, for this community, his name makes me think about home, sincere. It makes me think, am I living a sincere life? Am I living a life that uh, my parents have raised me to live? Am I, am I doing what I'm supposed to do on this planet, so to speak? So sincere to me is the, the reason he kind of, he was put into my life to sort of tap me to say, you know what, you have another mission. And that mission is to go back home and then to begin thinking even more about what your father asked you to do about his dad, my grandfather. So I always, uh, I always give sincere credit for not only letting the world know about the horrible crisis of the Flint water crisis that's still happening today, but he also helped me with sort of moving my life along and living my life with a little more purpose um, for myself and to help spread this story. So this is when I was driving home and from Detroit to, uh, to Richmond and I'm really thinking like what next, what next. Of course I'm going to go back and work at my family's newspaper, the Richmond Free Press, but then I made a decision to apply for a fellowship at the University of Michigan called the Knight Wallace uh, Fellowship and it's for journalists in mid-career and you can work on a project. So basically to uh, make the story fast, I, I was accepted, these are my fellow fellows and the project that I worked on, that I was given one year to work on, was to explore who my grandfather, Suruju Miyazaki, was. And so this is when I began my quest. And these are my colleagues, friends, who really supported me day by every day that I was learning something new. And so this is when I started really focusing on Suruju, my grandfather. And this is one of the first things I found is an old, uh, car registration and he had a Ford so and you can see his address 360 Washington Street and not only did he, did he live here but that he lived ab above his restaurant the Horseshoe Cafe and so this is when I started trying to visualize Suffolk at this time my grandfather looking at that picture constantly thinking like what the heck is he doing in Suffolk Virginia how did he get here? How did, you know, just all these questions. And just thinking, wow, he owned a car and a business. And so this is just another piece of paper that I found in my dad's things um, that he did have. And this was actually from 61, so I wish my dad was here to discuss it. Like, maybe my dad did begin a little bit of digging um, in the 60s. So this is a, from the, unclaimed property, yeah. And then of course I'm on campus and I'm trying to use resources. I'm calling here. Um, I'm calling all different places and this is from the 1930s, the, the census. So I do find him here in Suffolk. And he was one of two uh, Japanese men um, during this time. So this is 1930. And so a little bit about him. How did he get here? So through my research and through digging through these papers, I find that he had uh, left Japan at the age of 14 and he jumped on a ship and then somehow ended up in France and then somehow was there for four years and then jumped on a ship from um, Italy and got here to the port of Norfolk. 
and he landed here in 1922. And that was just one year after, actually, he was not legal. And so the year before, it was said, it is said that, or it is fact, that Asians were not allowed to come in at that time. So he came one year after that, that law was made. So he actually, I'm now putting it together and I'm now really understanding, because I'm li we're living this in real time again, I'm understanding who he is. So he's actually illegal in the United States and he's living in Suffolk for now 19 years. And so he went from the port of Norfolk and somehow ended up in Suffolk and he opened a, a restaurant called the Horseshoe Cafe and he also had another restaurant in Norfolk called Mike's Cafe. And I found out about that one. It's very interesting. There were a lot of Japanese men who owned restaurants in Norfolk. And my grandfather is the only one who owned two restaurants in this area. And most of the restaurants were run by other Japanese men. My grandfather had a black man running his restaurant in Norfolk. And then here in Suffolk, he's running it with, with um, other blacks, his relatives, my grandmother's relatives and friends in the area that is known as the fairgrounds, right? So, so then he's living his happy life. He had met my grandmother. Um, and then unfortunately, December 7th, 1941 comes around. And this is an article that I found just a little article that was in the um, Virginian pilot, and you can see it says, you know, two Japanese Japanese taken in Suffolk. And you can see they misspelled his name. It said Sui Ugua. So people don't. I mean, journalists are supposed to be careful, especially with names. But during this time, do you think they care? No. So, but I know this is him. And another gentleman named Shigeo Nagasato was also arrested at this time. And so they were both taken, and they were taken by the Suffolk police. And in Norfolk, the same thing was happening too. So a total in this area, there were about 30 Japanese men that were arrested on the day of Pearl Harbor. So this lets you know that they've been watching them prior to Pearl Harbor, because think about the, the time difference, and I mean, there's just so many things. So they knew where to come in and grab people. And that's what they did. They, they grabbed him for no reason. He's living his life as a, I mean, except I do find out now that he was not a, um, he was not legal at this time, but there were a lot of people and he'd been here 19 years. So, um, so they arrest him, they take him to the Suffolk jail. And then from there, he is taken to a detention center in Fort Howard, Maryland. And from there, he is held for one year. And in the meantime, when he gets there, that's December, the end of December, then we know in February, February 19th, 1942, Executive Order 9066 was signed. And so that is when Roosevelt said that all Japanese Americans and all people of Japanese descent must be, quote unquote, rounded up and taken to the various prison camps that were designated for Japanese. And so there were 10. So my grandfather actually, the when he went into detention, he was considered an alien enemy. He then went before an alien enemy, enemy board and they tried to say he was trying to poison water in this area. They say that he was going to poison Lake Prince. And I've taken a trip to Lake Prince, I mean, I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> I mean, come on. And so the board does say, okay, he is harmless. But now when they say it's harmless, he's harmless, now this executive order is in place. So he can't even come back to Virginia because now they're saying Virginia is off limits, the West Coast is off limits. So now he's sent to a prison camp in Arkansas. And the one that he went to is called Rower. And there's two camps, um, in Arkansas, Rower and Jerome. And this is also, if any of you are Star Trek fans, this is where George Takei was when he was a little boy with his family. So, and I did have the chance to meet Mr. Takei and told him a little bit about my grandfather and when we were visiting the, the prison site at the same time and he couldn't believe me. He said, are you sure about this information? I've never heard of anyone being arrested from the state of Virginia and from Suffolk, Virginia, and Norfolk? Are you sure there were Japanese there? 
I'm like, yes, sir, <laughs> yes, I'm sure I have all the facts. This is my family. So that's a part of what I think my dad, let's circle back to my dad, what he was hoping that I would help to correct, correct history and to let people know that this was not just happening on the West Coast. And not only, it was this was an American issue, and this also was happening within a black community. And I think that's something else that people don't think about too. And this was affecting a family, a black family, my family. So these are some of the pictures that I was able to find from the archives of the Virginian pilot, a Virginian pilot pho photographer. These files, just so you know, are at the um, Norfolk Library. That's where their um, archives are. And so this is a picture of majority of the men that were arrested that day. I have, my grandfather is not in this picture. Um, there is a friend of his though, that I now know that is a friend, this man here, his name is Mr. Toyota. But that's just through research that I've been able to put that together. Um, so you can see, they're being held in a room, We've got all these sailors around, and you know, they're just, so. And so you see you have someone guarding the door. So this was the actual day. And then this is also, again, Mr. Toyota, who later I find more about him, but he's being questioned. He actually was a part of the Navy. And so that I think that's probably why he's being scrutinized even more You know, here. They're asking him lots of questions. This is when I wish I could go back in time and interview them myself. <laughs> more pictures, pictures when they have to appear in court. And um, this here, too, is another gentleman that I learned to know that was a good friend of my grandfather's. His name is Mr. Mizutani. And Mr. Mizutani becomes very important to my grandfather because uh, later, when he's released from the prison camp in Arkansas, Mr. Mizutani had been released and sent to Chicago. And because my grandfather could not get back to Virginia, Mr. Mizutani had a job for my grandfather and helped him out. So. And this is him being, Mr. Mizutani being searched. And it's, I, I looked everywhere to see if I could find my grandfather's image in any of these pictures, but I didn't. But I think that's because there were two men that were from Suffolk, and I think that they were kept separate from the Norfolk men. That's my own, that's just my educated guess. More questioning. These were the front pages of the paper in Norfolk. Um, And these are the kind, this is here in uh, Norfolk, Jap shave free, not responsible for accidents. So you can see the kind of sentiment, the kind of uh, horrible things that were being thought and done and said. And it's kind of, yeah, so. And this is just all of those pictures that I put together and I did put my grandfather's picture there. This is just something that I, I shot as a still photo for myself. And then I decided, you know, I got to know a little bit more about this town, Suffolk, and like go to the restaurant, go and understand this area. So I come here, and I actually come here with a Japanese film crew. And the film crew he hears about my story, and they decide to do a documentary on me. And they decide to follow me on this journey. So they came here, and so I learned about the fairgrounds, and like, like I said, all of these things that my dad had said to me about where he grew up, but it just didn't, it stuck, but I didn't get the context. And I was a, you know, teenager who was, lit, or a daughter that was sometimes not listening to my dad. <laughs> and so, this is the restaurant. So this, many of you have probably driven by this street on East, Wa I mean, driven by this building on East Washington. And you see the sign, Horseshoe Cafe, that's on another building. Yeah. Right, so that is not his building. Mm -hmm. That was not the original Horseshoe Cafe. Many people are confused by that. So what happened, so this building here is where the original restaurant was. And this is where he lived. So this is just doors down from where the sign is today. And there's an alley. And so what happened on December 7th the business continued to run for three days. Okay, he put a family member in charge. 
and that family member ran the business and then they said nope we got to shut it down and so they shut the restaurant down they took the money from that day they itemized everything in the restaurant from the salt and pepper to the chairs to the safe to even the things in my grandfather's uh, apartment and you got to think about it my grandmother where is she in all of this right and those are the missing pieces that I'm trying to find out because she is actually quite young at the time there was a 20 year difference but I did find letters from the National Archives where she is writing to my grandfather and he's writing to her and she is desperately trying to like manage this building but they're not married because they couldn't be married well technically through my research I found out that they could have been married a black person and a Japanese person could be married the law was white person and anybody of color could not be married but people didn't care if other people married each other but it depended on who was at the desk right who's signing the the, the marriage license so I don't know I cannot answer why they weren't married but they weren't so there are a lot of rights that my grandmother didn't have right and she has these two little boys and my grandfather is gone he's the person making a living he's making good money and I find through my research he had three thousand dollars in a bank in Japan and he had two bank accounts here one uh, called the Seaboard uh, something something bank and then yes Seaboard Citizens and another bank in Norfolk so he had a lot of money um, and on those three days the amount of money that he made when he was not even present was about eight hundred and eighty nine dollars while he was gone and so he he's like where's my money that's like a sidebar conversation going on but I just want to like correct history because I know I talk to a lot of people today who, who swear that this is my grandfather's restaurant where the sign is that's not true and I'm trying to find any photographs that may have a sign in front of his original restaurant and I'm wondering if this sign did come from that building originally so if anybody has any photo has a photograph I would love to see it um, so then eventually this building was it was not owned by my grandfather the the owner he obtained a, an attorney named mr. Kilby uh, and mr. Kilby began to correspond with my grandfather while he was incarcerated in Arkansas and basically said if you don't pay the rent the restaurant is gone so it was shut down after three days and they rented it fast and I have letters where my grandmother is saying and other people are saying Mike um, people are rummaging through your things what are we gonna do and and you guys got to think we're not dealing with email so they're writing snail mail telling him and asking him what should I do but it's taking time and then the government is opening all of this mail stamping it getting in their business and so so just so you know that's the that's the fact on that restaurant um, and then the, the the thing that he is known for and I do believe that this he it's carried on today is this dish that he made called yak so um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah people know that <laughs> so I um, yeah and I think so I've read online and this also if you read it online this is not fact because there's one story that says my father gave the recipe to the woman who owned this next restaurant that's impossible my dad was only three years old so the facts have gotten blurred with this story so I'm trying to straighten the facts out as much as possible so she must have gotten the recipe maybe from people who worked for my grandfather and it just got passed on like that but it was not from my dad he was much too young and the last time he saw his dad was when he was three years old so so this was the the lake lake prince that he, they say that he was trying to contaminate allegedly and was going to poison all of our ancestors of Suffolk so we know that's not true and then the FBI and DOJ and INS said he was having meetings at the port of uh, Portsmouth mm -hmm. and so that was sketchy they're saying mm -hmm. so those are just some other and then my research took me to all these different places and then it also took me to McGee Arkansas and this was my grandfather's barrack number 3210 E 
and he was at a um, rower and in McGee, Arkansas. And he was writing lots of letters from there. And so I kind of, I know that, so this is, the way I'm talking is the way I've been researching actually. And it does meander here and there and to and from. And so you can kind of feel what I've been feeling. And then this also makes you kind of go into the, the shoes of my father. Imagine what he felt, the story that he never talked about, that pain that he carried all of his life. And now I'm really feeling it and I'm, it's heavy, it's heavy stuff. And, um, but through this research, in addition to wanting to know what happened in the United States with my grandfather, um, I did go to Japan. And because I started thinking, do I have family in Japan? And so I want to end off with this video. I hope it won't go over. To, I think I timed it just right. But we might not have, we'll have to have a little bit of time for questions. If you have any. And this will kind of just bring it all together a little bit. <laughs> story for right now and um, I am working on a book and there will be you know so many more details put in there and thank you so much for your time and your interest and filling this hot muggy room <laughs> <laughs> so um, if there are any questions or I don't know what happens at this point <laughs> yeah yes at the very last that was so very touching thank you for sharing that. thank you for listening um, they were, and they were related to how I didn't catch everything. Okay, so yeah, it was kind of hard. So those women, they are my second cousins. So they would have been my dad's first cousins. Their father and my grandfather were brothers. So their father was the eldest brother. So you know in a lot of uh, cultures, the eldest brother gets the house, gets the land. So that's kind of why... I've put together through research and talking to people probably why my grandfather set off because he was the youngest son and then there was another son who was killed um, in China during the war too. Um, so yeah, those are cousins and they're still living and we have this pen pal relationship and... Um, Do they have children? I mean. So the oldest one, Sumie san she's in her 90s, she does not have children. And so she's the eldest Miyazaki. But let's think about this. Had my, had my grandparents been married, my last name would not be Boone. My last name would be Miyazaki. My dad would have been Raymond Miyazaki. My brother would be Raymond Miyazaki Jr. My nephew would be Raymond Miyazaki III. So the Miyazaki name would go on. But right now, actually, it, she's the eldest one. The other sister's married, the other brothers, Die, and their child. There are no boys with the Miyazaki name. So that, once again, you've got to think about history and how American history has affected this one family so tragically on so many levels because of racism, because of xenophobia, because of hatred, because of just fear, fear, fear mongering. Yes, and it has disrupted my family and so many other families, not just mine. We're just one story. So, yeah, so that's who they were. Yes, sir. Do you know what happened to your grandfather after the war? Yes. So, yeah, it gets really convoluted. So I can only tell so much, but I'll tell you a little bit. So, yeah, he tried to, co he tried to come back to Suffolk. And they said, you've got to get a job to come back, even though he had been an entrepreneur, right? So he writes to a place called the Busy Bee Hotel. And the Busy Bee Hotel says, yes, we need help. You can get a job here, and we know you. Come on back, Mike. But the government says, no, you can't come back to the eastern region. It's too close to the port, right? Mm -hmm. And so they decide they're going to do something called a uh, resettlement program mm -hmm. for Japanese. And they said they are going to make Japanese go and integrate and lose their Japanese anything and go into Midwest, the Midwest, the middle of the country. So the first program was in one of the first was Chicago. 
So he was given $25 on a train ticket and he was sent to Chicago. And that's where that one man, Mr. Mizutani, he somehow had gotten there ahead of him. And he wrote to his friend and his friend said, oh, he sent him a telegraph. And I saw the telegraph and he got a job at a restaurant in Chicago. And then while in Chicago, he's working, living in boarding homes. And I've been to those places um, or where they used to be. And um, he eventually has tuberculosis. And he dies at the age of 48, tragically, at Cook County Hospital, alone there. I thought alone, but through research, I did find out that the man, Mr. Toyota, I found out through my research that my grandfather was Buddhist. So then I traced to a Buddhist temple that's been in Chicago for a long time. This Buddhist temple I called, and they said, oh, the Buddhist priest, he kept copious notes, and sometimes you know, he kept his journal. But I can't guarantee that he wrote any notes on the day your grandfather died or anything. I don't even know if he was very, I mean, uh, eulogized here. So we go, I go there, they pull the book, and lo and behold, <laughs> luck would have it, or that he did make notes on that day of uh, August 3rd for the wake, and then August 4th for the funeral. And then, I think it was a year and a half later, he was shipped back, his, his remains were shipped back to Japan, which I never knew. I had followed the trail of the, the death certificate that said that he was buried at a cemetery in Chicago, but those people there said no, he was cremated, and he was handed over to another funeral home. The that funeral home is out of business. So that's why I said, oh my God, he had the worst luck, right? And then, but, but, it's a happy ending, he had ended up getting back home. So that's, that's in a nutshell, what, that's what he was doing. <laughs> so, yes? Did your grandmother and grandfather ever reconnect no. after this? No. Did, did they ever get in touch? Or yes, letters, know? yeah, I see letters. But did they physically see each other? I think they saw each other maybe once or twice in Baltimore or Maryland when he was being held at Fort Howard detention. But then once he is, once that executive order goes into place in February, and all Japanese, all people of Japanese descent are, are snatched from their homes, and he's in Arkansas. And think about it, she is living in Jim Crow Suffolk. Nobody's trying to help. She never went to Chicago when he was. I mean, do you think she didn't have money? She I mean, she's poor. Money. She's struggling. This is racist times. Did they take away the money that he had? Yeah. Like he had all this money. I'm, I mean, I was thinking about that today with my mom. I was like, where is that? No, the government has the it. The government took it. Yeah, they took it. And they blocked his account. They did that to all Japanese Americans, though. That's not just to my grandfather. That's all people of Japanese descent. They blocked all their accounts. They took everything, ripped everything from them. And then, I mean, think about it. My grandmother, she's a young woman in segregated, harsh times of Suffolk, Virginia. You think anybody's listening to her, trying to help her out? Who's in charge, especially with the government? Mm -mm. I mean, it's sad, it's tragic, yes. As far as you go now, do yes. you feel like you accomplished what, what you had started to do? Are you happy with yes. what you found out now? Are you at peace with it, I guess? I am definitely at peace. Um, I think my, most, my dad is at peace, and mm -hmm. I think he can rest peacefully. And I think what, I'm at peace, but at the same time, I feel a lot of pain and trauma. Yeah. And it's that, what I'm learning even, I mean, I know this from the black side of me, of course, right? From slavery and Jim Crow and all that stuff, intergenerational pain and trauma that's passed down. So now I got another layer of this that I'm dealing with. And so now I'm really feeling it, reading these old documents and like, that energy is being transferred to me. And then thinking about my father, that little boy who was living around here. I mean, he had a nice life. His, you know, the village raised him, his family. Um, but at the same time, he didn't know what really happened. And this was such a secret. So yes, I'm at peace and my dad's at peace, I think. And, but there is some yeah. emotion. <laughs> yeah. Yes? You see it. Minutes ago, that the government took his grandfather's money. Were, yeah. Were they ever awarded reparations? So, later? yeah, so yeah, during the Reagan administration, if you were alive, like if he had been alive, uh -huh. he could have received $20,000. Yeah, but no descendants can, yeah. So, yeah, had he lived, and he, he, he would have been an old man at that time, he could have received that. 
$20,000. But is $20,000 really a good trade-off for a disruption of how many families and how many lives? To me, that's just like, whatever. I mean, that's just how I say it, see it. I mean. They felt, they, they felt the Japanese were Japanese temple houses. Yes. Because at that time, we had to have blackout curtains. Yeah. We'd have blackout headlights. Everybody was afraid if a plane came over. Right. And so they thought all Japanese people were Japanese right. sympathizers. Yeah. That's why they did that. I mean, I know, and that, but that's a lot of, but that's, there was no fact with it, though. You see what I'm saying? They were creating this hysteria. Well, Pearl Harbor's the fact. Well, yes, it is, but it, that's true. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that someone who's born or someone who's living here, been here for many yeah, he was illegal, I did find that out, but at the same time, he's been living here and having a good life and all these other families throughout the United States. Now, to clear up the sign thing, from what I understand, I'm the older person here. Yes. The buildings, if you notice, sits on angle. Yes. From what we understand, that sign was put on this building because coming down the street, you can see the sign. If you put it on the other building, on this building, and you went down the street, you would go right back. Yeah, but I, but that was never. Yeah, but that's that was what the, I was told. Okay, yeah, but that was never his building. So I mean, that's no. the next chapter. Yeah, I'm talking about the building that where the sign is owned. Okay. They figured if you came down East Washington Street, yeah, you would see that sign sitting on that building. If you put it over on his restaurant, okay. you wouldn't see the sign until you got beyond it. Oh, so you're saying it's always been there? Yes. Oh. As okay. far as I remember. And that sign stayed there for years and years and years after he was gone. So you think it was there on December 7th, 1941? It was on that building and not his building? I'm pretty sure it was. So that's why I'm looking for a photograph. It, Just so I need a photograph from that era well, to make it fact. I was too small to be taken to pictures. <laughs> no, I know that. <laughs> no, I understand that. And I, I appreciate your... The self-news Earl will probably have pictures in theirs that you could go back and look at and it will have pictures of East Washington down there because of all the peanut factors in the area. Yes. If you go to Suffolk News Herald, yes. they will probably have some pictures of East Washington Street and you'll see where it was at. Well, that's where I started my research. I started here in Suffolk, but you have to understand, I don't think a lot of people from those newspapers were really caring about the black area of town. Well, yes, so, they were. Well, I haven't found a photo yet, it was not documented. So if you can help me find one, I would be so... I also yeah. think they have very good archives either. They don't. They told me they lost most of them. So, I mean, I have been in touch, and there's someone here from the paper, and we've communicated. and So I've done my... So that's why I kind of am talking to regular people like you and me. Try, maybe someone has a, a shoebox. You were talking about... You mentioned uh, fairgrounds. <coughs> yes. Right last night, no, night before last, right on Facebook, yes. there was a picture and somebody was talking about fairground being across from Blueberry Hill. Okay. Well, I've been to all of them. And, and so anybody could have looked on there and read that about fairgrounds. But all of it on there was not true. So which fairground are you talking about? Man? Probably Blueberry Hill. Blueberry Hill was a restaurant. Yeah, I know what Blueberry Hill was a restaurant. It was also a fairground in the back. Yeah, it was a fairground in the back, but it also the area of town. Yeah, but it also up where her grandfather's restaurant that was called the fairground. Yeah, the area. It's like the, where the train tracks make it like a little island. So that was it. called fairground. Yes. They probably got it built, built in the new area called fairground. The only reason okay. they called the fairgrounds by Blueberry Hill, they called it because there was a fair. That was a fair. Yeah. 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 Right. 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 But this is a different area. But the fairgrounds downtown across the tracks, that was a black, black area. Predominantly exact area. Yeah. The yeah. Phoenix Bank. Yes. And all the different. It was the Black Wall Street of exactly. Suffolk. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's where his business was. Exactly. Yes. But I don't know if that sign was there. Yeah, that's that what I. Because I think the lady that owned that building later, that where I grew up, yes. called it the horseshoe. Yeah, it she's different from the original. Exactly, horseshoe. but we don't know if maybe she was able to somehow someone pass that sign down. That's why I just want to see a photograph. 
I'm not sure, but I can find out. I know some people that are older than I am. So anything before yeah. December 7th, 1940, or up until three days after 41, December 10th. So, Meryl, yes? Harry Lambert is right here in the coast of the Harry Lambert uh -huh. is the lady that had the horseshoe. But she worked in the same horseshoe that Zach had. Okay. She worked there until she moved further down. Okay. And she worked, she was there a, a while in that spot before she had that horseshoe put up there. Okay, she, so she, she did, had that sign. She made. did it herself. Okay, so then I, I, I can witness to that because I was old enough and I, I remember when it was done. Yeah, so, that sign wasn't always there. Okay, I was 65, and it wasn't there when I was there. Okay, so that's that's good to know. Okay, yeah, but a lot of people think that that was the original restaurant yeah. where the sign is. So I was just clarifying that that's where he lived and worked the other building. Yeah. Yes, he had the small Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I heard it was um, something called Yacht. <laughs> and other food. Yeah, I guess other southern food. Maybe he was like the original farm to table. I mean, everybody was original farm to table back then, right? And fusion, maybe a little bit of what he knew from his mom and back home. Because now I have visited his hometown. And there is a dish called champo that is very similar. That's a, it's a unique dish to his hometown. It's just like yak. And it's like he took the ingredients that he had here, like ketchup and soy sauce. I mean, they weren't using ketchup over there, but I think he maybe did the best he could. And so I had that dish in Nagas, in Minamishimabara, where he was from. And you know, they, and I told them about this dish here. They're like, oh, it's so similar. So I feel like, like when I drive through Suffolk now, certain parts, or just coming here from Richmond, and having driven in uh, Nagasaki, the seaside farming town that he's originally from, there's so much of a similarity. So I see why he probably fell in love with this area. It was very nostalgic for him, probably, and just easy to, to get along. Yes? The village he was from was in, was in Nagasaki? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, so Nagasaki is a prefecture, and then there's a city. So it's just like being from Virginia. So it'd be like New York, New York, Nagasaki, Nagasaki, but he's from Minamishimabara, Nagasaki. Okay. So in Japanese, they say like the prefecture, which means like the state, or you know, so that's, okay. yeah. So he's from Nagasaki, but always before doing this research, I, on the government documents, it never specified what city he was from. It just said Nagasaki. So in my heart, I was always like, oh God, the bomb you know, was dropped there. I was like, oh, he had bad luck on both sides of the ocean. So, but then I was relieved when this documentary, this little news clip was done. The relatives, I mean, what's the likelihood of two, two not 80, 88 plus year old and a 90 plus year old watching the news I mean, they do that, right? You guys, everybody, we all do that. We have certain habits. But they were doing this in their separate homes at the same time, happened to watch their local news and saw their uncle on TV and then called each other and were like, oh my God, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, so from Nagasaki. So we had pinpointed that area. Yeah. Yeah, so. All right, I know it's hot, guys. So thank you so much. <laughs>